Well, hello and welcome everybody to the latest Hong Kong Free Press uh, live interview. Um, our guest today is Lord Chris Patton, the last British colonial governor of Hong Kong before its handover to China in 97. He chaired the Conservative Party from 1990 to 1992 and served as the European Commissioner for External Relations for four years. He's currently the Chancellor of the University of Oxford um, and he is a patron of Hong Kong Watch, the NGO. Uh, thank you, Lord Patton, for uh, joining us. I'm delighted to be with you. I, I, um, I follow Hong Kong Free Press avidly. I hope that doesn't get you into trouble, but so do thousands of other people around the world who want to know what's happening in, in uh, a great international financial city. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, I appreciate it. I know that last time we met, um, it was in person in 2017. Um, and I guess that brings me neatly to my first question. I'm Seeing how things are nowadays, do you pretty much take for granted that you would probably be denied entry if you were to uh, try and visit again? I don't know. It would be very sad. Um, my wife and I were talking last night, actually, about uh, the happiest year of our lives. And we had, we've got quite a few to be grateful for. Um, but we decided it would have to be one of the years we spent in Hong Kong, probably... Um, 1995 or 1996, um, uh, I was hugely happy there. Um, and I've always been happy to come back, to be invited back. Um, uh, now, if I wasn't to be allowed back, it wouldn't be because of the Hong Kong government. I mean, they're, they're a cardboard cutout now, as you know. They're, they're simply a transmission mechanism for decisions taken uh, in Beijing by the real rulers of, of Hong Kong, and particularly the local Com Communist Party boss in, in uh, uh, in uh, Hong Kong, Luo Hui Ning. Um, so uh, would they let me back um, in, in Hong Kong again? Am I such a terrifying figure that they wouldn't let me in? Um, let me just remind you of this. When I was governor of Hong Kong, um, trying to do a certain amount to safeguard the rule of law and have a system of elections which was fair and free, if not entirely controlled. I remember one uh, pro-Chinese toady um, were pro, not Chinese, pro-communist toady, saying to me, um, it's not, you, you get us wrong, it's not that we dislike um, elections, we just like to know who's going to win in advance. Um, so when I tried to clear up things like that and made it clear that my main job was to stand up for Hong Kong, not simply to be a conduit for whatever um, the Communist Party wanted to do in Hong Kong, I was denounced uphill and down there. I was told I was a sinner condemned for a thousand generation generations. I was told that um, I, I was a whore. Um, I was somebody who'd, um, they used a rather vulgar expression, um, uh, had a re relationship with President Clinton. Um, the best I was called was a, was a tango dancer. So you'd have thought I was absolutely blackened for eternity. I then became um, the Commissioner for External Affairs in, in Brussels for Europe, um, in, in effect, the Foreign Minister for Europe. Um, responsible or partly responsible for um, our policy on China and for doing things like negotiate WT access. And when the then Chinese foreign minister came to see me in, I should think it was 2000, might have been 1999, he read very solemnly for a piece from a piece of paper and said, uh, we should, you should know, um, uh, Pang Ting Hong, he said, you should know that um, the leadership have considered your position and they have decided you are a force for concord, not discord. So suddenly, suddenly, the condemned for a thousand years had been wiped out. I'd earned remission um, for, my, for my terrible sins. And shortly after that, my wife and I and family were invited by Jiang Zemin, um, who was, I think, a rather underestimated figure, to go on a, to go on a sort of semi-official visit to China and to go around to China um, looking at what we wanted. Uh, the the people who were organising it were rather disappointed that I wasn't able to take all my children, but I, because they'd heard about them or seen pictures of them, but just my wife and myself, and we finished up after this extremely interesting trip with a forty-five minute conversation with Jiang Zemin. At the end of which, as I was leaving, his interpreter produced a copy of my book East and West and asked me if I would um, autograph it for him. So, the sinner condemned for a thousand generations. Um, uh, was uh, was um, uh, was pardoned, and more than that. So you never know. I mean, they go through these these um, uh, these paroxysms of bullying and targeting people, 
as though it was individuals that were the problem. The problem is the system. The problem is what um, a totalitarianism, communist totalitarianism means today. That's, that's the problem. Um, and it's, it's a profound weakness of, of, uh, of the communist system of governance in China, that they're scared of people like me, that they're scared of people like Martin Lee um, and, uh, uh, and Margaret Ung and others. Uh, they're scared of jokes. They're scared of songs. Why, why is it so scary for people to see, say, sing Glory to the Hong Kong? Why is it so scary for people to um, want to sing um, an anthem from Les Miserables? Why do those things scare these leaders witless? Um, because they have no confidence in the, uh, in the longevity of their own system. If they once have to allow people to know what's going on in the world, if they allow free debate, um, if they allow independent courts, those are the things that, that um, scare them. And you have to ask yourself, is this a system of governance which is going to last forever? So um, I know my answer to that. I just hope I live long enough to uh, uh, come back to uh, Hong Kong, which I love. Some of the most wonderful people I've met in, are in Hong Kong. It was the place where, it sounds an odd thing to say, but I most enjoyed um, living my religion as a Catholic. Um, so I hope I can come back. And I promise, I promise, I promise um, this Mr. Luo or whoever's really running Hong Kong now, I promise I'll be a very good boy. I won't, I won't tell anybody to throw bricks. <laughs> I, I won't, I won't burst into song won't, for a moment there. <laughs> I won't advocate the police colluding with the triads to beat up demonstrators. I won't do anything like that. Um, I'll be very, a very good boy and just say what I think, which is what I've always done. Well, I, as you said, you've been called all kinds of colourful things over the years, and it continues, I'm sure, in state media at the moment. I think perhaps it's not only a concern about whether they'll let you in. Of course, under this security law, um, it's, it's extraterritorial, and they, in theory, could apparently arrest people coming through the airport. But before we get into too much on this security law, I just wanted to ask a couple more tough ones before I disappear. But, you know, there's a sense that with the foreign interference stipulations uh, in this security law, um, is there a fear sometimes one might be doing more harm than good if we are speaking out, you know, about Hong Kong uh, from abroad? Uh, these comments, you know, coming from foreign officials, governments, NGOs, they're always instantly uh, dismissed as, as interference uh, and supposedly can open one up to, you know, legal uh, repercussions as well. Um, has this thought, you know, crossed your mind, particularly when you've interacted with the likes of Jimmy Lai and people who are going through the courts now? Yeah, I, I think I think the the difficulty which I constantly um, find myself thinking about is not whether um, uh, it would be a good idea to allow um, the Chinese communist regime to stifle any discussion uh, about uh, Hong Kong or any knowledge of what's happening in Hong Kong. That's what they want to do. Uh, that's why Perry Lynx, the great uh, sinologist, the great Chinese scholar in America, described the system of governance, the system of the law in, in China as like an anaconda in the chandelier. You know that there is this ominous thing above you and uh, you're worried that you won't quite know the point at which the python drops on your head. Um, so of, of course they want to, to stifle debate. My worry is that I don't want to say anything or do anything which will make life harder for the ordinary people of Hong Kong, which is why when I was the governor, to people's surprise, I used to go and advocate um, most favored nation status for China when I went to Washington, because I didn't want to see um, uh, trade difficulties hurting the economy in Hong Kong, and that remains my position. So I want to speak out about Hong Kong, uh, but I don't want to, to say anything which will make the future more difficult in Hong Kong for people. It's the Chinese communist regime in Beijing which is screwing Hong Kong, which is making life difficult in Hong Kong. What has made, what, has, what have been the things that have really been important to Hong Kong's success? The separation of powers between the legislature, the executive and the judiciary, the free movement of capital, the free movement of ideas, the rule of law with independent courts. You take, start knocking the, the, the pins from under those things, and it inevitably has an economic effect uh, in Hong Kong. 
uh, look look at look at what's happening with 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 banks which are trying to straddle um the mafia on one ha- on the one hand or the mafia uh, the beijing mafia on the one hand and their customers and their shareholders in open societies in the west on the other i mean it it becomes extremely difficult but the difficulty is created by xi jinping and his regime they are the people who are going, who are screwing hong kong and i don't think it's unreasonable to point that out I was, I was very keen to catch up with you, but I'm going to um, hand over to Kelly Ho uh, for the next few. So yeah, like bear in mind um, the push over uh, the push back over foreign interference. Is this going to change um, the mission and actions of um, the NGO Hong Kong Watch? Well, first of all, um, no, it certainly won't. First of all, foreign interference. Who interferes? You look at what the Chinese Communist Party does in Australia in Canada, in the United Kingdom, anywhere where people disagree with the Chinese Communist Party narrative. So they say, oh, you mustn't impossibly meet anybody who's, who's been anywhere near Taiwan. You mustn't meet the, the Dalai Lama. You must stop saying these, these rude things about the Chinese Communist Party. You mustn't uh, have film about the genocide in, in Xinjiang. You mustn't talk about the forced labor uh, in Xinjiang. You mustn't talk about the um, the way we've killed Indian soldiers in the Himalayas. You mustn't court about, court, talk about the threats we make of coercive diplomacy with countries. Who's interfering? It's these, it's these I, think, I think they now call themselves proudly wolf warrior diplomats. They're not diplomats. Who is, who is interfering? When, for example, two innocent Canadian citizens, one of whom by, by chance used to work for an organization called the International Crisis Group, of which I was the um, co-chairman. Um, I didn't know the guy, but I knew he worked for us. Uh, two Canadian citizens who were approaching their second Christmas in solitary confinement because of an argument between China and Canada over the legal process involving a senior Huawei executive. Mm-hmm. So two Canadians are picked up as hostages rather like Anthony Gray was in the late 1960s. They're there in, uh, uh, in cells, um, 24 hours a day with the lights on. They aren't allowed any visitors. They aren't allowed any reading material. They've got filthy food. And they are being used as pawns, wickedly being used by pawns for the Chinese to try to um, gain an advantage over Canada. It's appalling behavior. This isn't the way a great civilization a great country behaves and it's the way the Chinese communists behave which is why it's important to distinguish between China and Chinese civilization and the Communist Party. I noticed um, in the film about Xinjiang yesterday one of the uh, Chinese communist officials who was explaining how uh, these Uyghur Muslims were, were in, were in uh, these uh, uh, in effect concentration camps and um, for their own good he said, what they've got to learn, first of all, is to love the Communist Party. Hey, eh? It's this delusion that Chinese Communist leaders have, that in order to love China, you have to love the Communist Party. It's what's called in, in theology consubstantiality. You've got to love Ch- the Communist Party in order to love China. The two are part of the same thing. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. People, um, I think, found that impossible to swallow in Hong Kong, where, mm-hmm. after all, Two thirds, I suppose, maybe more of the population are themselves refugees from modern Chinese communist history or the family of refugees. Secondly, um, it's not uh, something that people, Chinese citizens in Taiwan, um, believe. So I'm sure that a lot of people in China uh, don't believe it either, but are probably too nervous to say it because they get locked up straight away. Mm-hmm. So we talked about um, foreign interference uh, stipulations under the national security law. Can we go back um, to talk about um, what you've uh, put forward before you left your post as the governor of Hong Kong? So if you remember, you um, set up um, 16 benchmarks for measuring whether the two systems are are surviving in one country. Uh, For instance, you said the world should look at Hong Kong and see if democratic politicians are still playing continue to play an active role in local politics or whether they are being excluded or marginalized um, by external pressure. Um, The world should also see whether anybody in Hong Kong are being prosecuted or harassed for peaceful expression 
um, of political, social, or religious views, and whether um, you know the press in Hong Kong is still free, you know, with uninhibited coverage of China and of issues on which China has strong views. So may I ask, what predictions did you have in mind when you came up with those 16 uh, benchmarks? And are your predictions different from what actually happened in the city after you left? Well, they were less my predictions than my um, checklist of how you could um, make your mind up about whether Hong Kong had been, had been left alone with what had been, what had been promised the high degree of, degree of autonomy and the way of life which had made helped to make it so successful. Um, and when you look at that list, um, you'd have to have a, 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 a sort of sick sense of irony to think that um, the answer to those questions was that it was all fine. I mean, far from democratic politicians um, or any politicians who were prepared to have different views to those of the uh, cardboard cutouts who actually run the regime for China, and um, for the Chinese Communist Party, you, you, you'd have to be have a have a terrible sick sense of irony to think that they were actually part of part of the action, part of governance. They're being put in prison. They're being put in prison as frequently as possible. Do you have a, a, a free media? Well, um, you might ask somebody who works for Apple Daily that. Now, I think we know what the what the answers are to that. Is there any sense of of legality anymore about the way that the police have been allowed to operate. The police service used to be called Asia's finest. It's been used by the Chinese Communist Party, by the security ministry, as an agent of Chinese communist power. I know quite a lot about policing, not just in Hong Kong, but elsewhere. After I left Hong Kong, I had the job of reorganizing the police service in Northern Ireland after years of, of trouble, uh, after violence, after accusations against the police of trampling on people's human rights, and after uh, many police had been killed by, by terrorists. So I know about public order policing, and I know that public order policing sensibly is not what we saw in those demonstrations a year ago and a little less. I'm absolutely convinced in my own mind that all this, that the national security law and so on, um, was, could have been avoided. And there were two ways it could have been avoided. First of all, if um, uh, the chief executive, insofar as she's responsible for anything, except doing what the Chinese Communist Party tells her to do, if she had, and the government had reacted more sensibly over the repatriation proposals. Secondly, if they'd made sure that the policing that was carried out was in the best traditions of Hong Kong policing, of course, there were some things that were done which nobody uh, would, uh, would defend in terms of, of, of violence on the fringes, but it was mostly a consequence of reaction to the way the police were behaving. How were people supposed to demonstrate? How were they supposed to um, react to the police after the police had plainly colluded with triads at Yuen Long? How were people supposed to react to that? Look, I was... I had friends who were police officers who looked after me for five years. They were wonderful guys. I knew some terrific people in the police service, but we know that that is not the police service which is being created in the image of the state security organs in, uh, in Beijing. And I'm sure in my own mind that there are representatives of those organs actually present in the police service today. Mm -hmm. So um, over the past year, Hong Kong has seen an exodus of um, pro-democracy political figures to the UK, um, including prominent activists Nathan Law and more recently former lawmaker Ted Hoi. Um, do you think the UK is truly um, a safe haven from the terror of the CCP as described by Hoi? Yes, I do. And it's not just um, well-known dissidents. Sorry, it's my other phone. It's not just well-known dissidents who are coming to um, who are coming to the United Kingdom. There is a lot of evidence that uh, more and more people are taking up the opportunities um, through the BNO passport scheme to come. Uh, I think that uh, what you're likely to see um, is a steady movement of, of, for example, younger professionals who aren't already um, tied by family. Um, uh, or a, a job they've been doing for a long time. I think there'll be a movement of, of unfortunately for Hong Kong, out of Hong Kong by people like that, um, to live in uh, other um, 
other open societies, whether UK or Australia or Canada. But people will be very, very lucky to have talented people from Hong Kong, hardworking people from Hong Kong. Uh, it's a pity that uh, some of them don't feel they can stay in Hong Kong um, anymore. That's a tragedy. We've already, of course, got a lot of students from Hong Kong. Um, at, at my own university, where there are probably uh, 1,200 or so mainland students, there are probably 200 plus Hong Kong students. And what we've got to make sure about is that they're not um, in a position where uh, some from the mainland are uh, telling tales about them, are not acting as paid narcs by the Chinese embassy, which does this sort of thing all over the world. United Front activities are a danger to any decent Chinese people, people whether from the mainland or Hong Kong, uh, living in um, uh, open societies like ours. So we have to be very open to, for that, but there's certainly no question of people um, being um, sent back to China under the national security law, partly because we don't have an extradition agreement, but partly because it would bring down a government if anybody tried to do that. Um, uh, people are free, as I hope the Home Secretary said, made clear the other day with, with um, Nathan Law, people are free whether they've been active uh, democratic campaigners or not. A lot of them will be absolutely apolitical. La last year, I was walking in um, a local park, Richmond Park, near where I live with my dog. And I was walking with um, a great uh, priest friend of and four people came up to, up to me and said uh, they were from Hong Kong. And one of them said, you may not recognize me, but I'm, I'm doing a doctorate um, in uh, medical studies. He was working, I think, on diabetes uh, in Oxford. You met me once when you came to the Lyon Light Medical School. Um, uh, and he was there with, with his girlfriend and another couple. And they said to me, um, Governor, they said, Pang Ting Hong, should we, should we go back to Hong Kong? Should we emigrate? Should we stay there? Well, I used to argue that people should stay because what Hong Kong represents and the ideas which have made Hong Kong the success story it is um, are going to survive a lot longer than whatever it is that the Hong Kong government, whistlings who are running Hong Kong, uh, believe in, which is, I suppose, um, feathering their own nests. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's it's maybe it's more decent than that. I rather doubt it. Come Might have lost um, Lord Patton there. Let's uh, give it a moment to see if uh, we can get him back. Uh, you mentioned just now, um, uh, Lord Patton, about um, you know p people fleeing, moving this exodus to the UK. Some activists, such as uh, Ted Hoy, um, going over to Britain quite recently. But um, you know, is, is this rather cynical after many years of of only just. Uh, commenting and condemning, you know, some of the things that have been happening in Hong Kong from London. And is, doesn't Brexit play into this somewhat in that there may be an incoming uh, brain drain happening? And as you say, there are a lot of very skilled, qualified people who um, may be signing up for passports now. Is, is, this, is there some opportunism, I think, by London, perhaps? And, um, and is there a risk that after Brexit, um, the London may end up being a bit more submissive to Beijing when it hasn't got the clout of the EU behind it to push back? Uh, first of all, um, the last point is um, certainly a possibility, but I don't think, don't think it'll happen. Um, I said earlier that I think part of the genius of the Chinese Communist Party is to unite the right and the left in their, um, in their concern about the way that China has been trying to bully the rest of the world into accepting the Communist Party's narrative about what's been happening, whether it's the origins of coronavirus or whether it's um, genocide in, in Xinjiang uh, or whatever. So I, I don't think that the House of Commons, the parliament is going to allow uh, anybody to, um, uh, to turn into uh, what I think Hua Guofeng was called a whatever is, that whatever China does, um, is, is all right by us. Um, one, one very pro-China, um, pro-Chinese communist um, uh, official, uh, uh, guy in, in the UK, used to be a banker, said at the outset, 
Uh, if we're leaving the European Union, the last thing we should do is want to pick a fight with China. It's not a question of us trying to pick a fight with China. China's trying to pick a fight with everybody uh, under the Xi Jinping regime, which is very different from, I think, other Chinese governments in the past. So I don't think that's a danger, nor do I think that um, it's cynical to do something which I thought we should have done a long time ago. As you know, when I was governor of Hong Kong, I was in favor of much more liberal, with the, with the sense of open-handed um, approach to giving people passports and uh, uh, rights of settlement and, uh, uh, and visas than some politicians at the time were prepared to do. But, but let, me, let me just underline the point. We're not trying to um, <clears throat> act as magnets for people coming from Hong Kong. What we want to do is to show a responsibility to those who find what's happening in Hong Kong much too difficult to take, that it's not the sort of society they want to live in or to bring their family up in. Um, I think <clears throat> every person who leaves Hong Kong or elsewhere is a loss to Hong Kong and a gain to wherever they're going, whether it's, um, whether it's Britain or Australia or Canada or the United States, Taiwan or wherever. So um, I, I think it would be a sad sign of what happens when you allow the Chinese Communist Party to replace the Bahinia as Hong Kong's emblem with them um, handcuffs and chains, uh, which is, I'm afraid, what they're doing at the moment. So uh, I, I hope that things will change and that people will feel that more of them can make their life in a free, so in a free society, a Chinese society, but a free society. Um, but I don't think the Chinese Communist Party is making that easy. But I repeat that anybody who comes from uh, Hong Kong uh, to live in London will be a net plus to Britain and a net loss to Hong Kong. So recently, uh, a Hong Konger who is based in Taiwan, Lam Wing Ki, he uh, was a bookseller in Hong Kong and he alleged uh, Chinese agents of kidnapping him back in 2015. Um, now he's living in exile in um, Taiwan. He recently urged uh, Hong Kong citizens to leave the city as soon as possible. Um, would you offer the same advice to the people of Hong Kong? No, I wouldn't. As I said earlier, um, I would simply say, that they should make their own personal judgment about what sort of society they live in and what they want for their families, their children, their parents, and so on. But I certainly wouldn't be so presumptuous as to give people that sort of advice. I understand why he does because of his own personal experience. But I'm aware of the fact that, um, first of all, um, I'm not having to face decisions about my future, uh, which involve considering uh, giving up my belief in freedom um, or the rule of law. So I'm not in the same position as, as people in Hong Kong. Uh, secondly, um, I'm not um, faced by the prospect of the sort of sanctions and penalties which can fall suddenly on your head um, in Hong Kong these days with the, the rule of law becoming a, um, a memory um, with a government which denies, denies, that the separation of powers was ever a central part of Hong Kong's system of governance and way of life. I mean, how can somebody who's been a civil servant during, during the period before 1997 seriously think that? How can anybody who's read the joint declaration or the basic law seriously think that? Um, to be in a situation where people are criticized for criticizing, for example, the way that um, Dem Democrats and Jimmy Lai have been treated, as interference, when they are trying to appoint the judges and interfering in the most profound way with the question of an independent judiciary. It's intolerably hypo hypocritical. We talked about, you know, um, Hong Kong people leaving um, the city for countries like the UK, and we briefly talked about, um, you know, offering more rights to um, you know, passport holders, uh, BNO passport holders. Um, do you think the extended BNO rights would cause any um, grievances in the UK? Any, no, I, I think that one, what's quite interesting is normally the issue of greater immigration to the United Kingdom for 50 years has caused um, a lot of um, political arguments. 
I'm su delighted and surprised that this question of giving rights to BNO passports holders is um, accepted right across the board. Um, it's supported by some of our most right-wing newspapers, um, as well as some of our most right-wing politicians. Look, I'm, I'm in the, um, I belong to uh, an organization which is concerned about China, Chinese communist behavior, um, and about what's happening in Hong Kong. And I'm, I'm as you know, supposed to be, or thought to be a moderate left-wing conservative. I'm in the same organization with people who are very right-wing and conservatives who regard my views on subjects like Brexit as terrible. Um, but, but, but this is the this is the fantastic success of Xi Jinping to unite the Conservative Party in favour of um, doing the decent thing by BNO passport holders. Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, um, who uh, was meeting Nathan Law the other day in front of the Bauhinia, um, Priti Patel is not thought to be a soft touch as a Home Secretary. So uh, people sometimes give the impression that they think the the Chinese communist leadership is brilliantly successful, is fantastically clever about the strategy it produces. It's not. And even though I think at the moment it's in it's in its peak China in relation to others um, because of its um, economic achievements, which are considerable, I think China faces in the next few years terrible problems, not just of governance, but about um, demography, about debt, which is now 325, 330% of GDP, about drought, about water shortage. These are really huge problems. And um, uh, if I was Xi Jinping, chance would be a fine thing. I think I'd be focusing more on those than trying to um, lock up people in Hong Kong. By the way, do you think that flag incident that caused the huge kerfuffle uh, with the government here was was a bit of a mess up or was it a deliberate thing? Was it, was it meant to be provocative? Which is the flag thing? A Bohemia flag with Nathan Law at that meeting with Priti Patel. I shouldn't think um, anybody thought about it as a, as a provocation. They thought it was about, it was an indication of where Nathan Law came from, just in case some um, people didn't know. <laughs> but I think I'd much prefer to think of Nathan Law or Ted Hoy um, or their colleagues or Joshua Wong um, uh, or Agnes Chow or others, I'd, lo I'd love to see them re regarded more as, as symbols of Hong Kong than some of those who speak out for it at the moment. I mean, the Secretary of Justice, um, for example, I think is, is um, I'm sorry she was hurt when she was in London not very long ago. Um, there's no excuse for that, but I don't think she's a very good symbol of um, what Hong Kong should be like. So do you have anything to say to the lead, the current leader of Hong Kong, um, Chief Executive Carrie Lam? Well, I don't think she's the leader of Hong Kong. I mean, I think that the leader of Hong Kong is, is the, in Hong Kong is, is Mr. Luo, the, the uh, Chinese communist enforcer. Um, I don't think um, uh, the purported leader of Hong Kong um, does anything which um, the Chinese Communist Party don't want or don't like. Um, I think she represents um, uh, Beijing in Hong Kong, not Hong Kong in Beijing. So, I mean, I think it's sad that it's come to this, uh, but I think that's that's the truth of the matter. She's, people say she's chief executive. Well, she's only chief in one sense. She has the chief responsibility for doing whatever um, the Politburo in Beijing wants to happen in Hong Kong. So that's, that's, that's the degree of chief that she has about her. And I suppose she makes decisions about, I don't know, refuse collection or things like that. But but um, but no, Hong Kong's being run by Beijing. Mm -hmm. It's been more than a year since the anti-extradition bill protests uh, erupted in Hong Kong and Hong Kong ex has experienced a year of unrest. Where do you see um, the local pro-democracy movement going um, in the future, um, you know, in light of the national security law and um, other forms of um, crackdowns as described by critics. Yeah, no, no Democrats left in the legislature now. Uh, what avenues are there? Yeah, well, I think it was um, Nelson Mandela who said, you can lock up a person, but you can't lock up an idea. Um, I was very struck by the youth of some of those who were so prominent in the democracy movement. Um, I criticise them sometimes, not least to their face, for not taking more account of older people who campaign for democracy, who I sometimes think 
were giving advice that should have been listened to. But nevertheless, I was very struck by their age and by the sense in which some Chinese officials gave the impression that what was happening in Hong Kong was all because of me or people like me. These were people, many of whom were either in nappies or weren't, or weren't even born when I was, um, when I was governor of Hong Kong. Um, and the ideas that um, people have, have espoused and embraced, are they know perfectly well ideas at the heart of what makes a decent and successful society. You can turn Hong Kong um, into a place where um, it's um, safe for um, rich, well-connected um, uh, Chinese communist leaders and their families to invest their money. You can turn Hong Kong into um, a, uh, a, a, I suppose, a, 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 a rather, a replica of Shenzhen or another Chinese city. But you certainly lose something if you take away spitefully and vengefully um, the things which have made Hong Kong in the past such a success story. Look, Hong Kong has been a fantastic global success with no natural resources at all, except for the harbour, which has got smaller and smaller. Um, the resource has been the scaffolding produced by freedom and the rule of law for extraordinarily resilient, extraordinarily resilient Chinese men and women, many of them the refugees from what happened in China. And so that includes some of the, um, some of the big cheeses among the pro-Beijing people. I mean, I, I'm struck by how many of those were themselves refugees from Shanghai or elsewhere. I'm also very struck by the number of them who, whatever they say and whatever they purport to believe, <coughs> still manage to have foreign passports in their back pockets. <laughs> It'd be nice if everybody who spoke out saying how fantastic the system was in, in, uh, in, um, the, in mainland China was obliged to declare whether she or he had a foreign passport. I think I'm right in saying that my immediate successor as chief, as chief executive, I think his family all had American passports. Um, I think I'm right in saying that Carrie Lam, until she became the quote chief unquote executive, had a British passport. And I think I'm right in saying that her husband and sons have British passports. I'm not, I'm not um, saying they shouldn't have. I think it's admirable. I'm sure they're very nice and good and diligent people. But it's rather odd if you think that the Chinese communist regime is so fantastic uh, that you feel obliged to have a foreign passport. The only person involved, I think, in drafting the national security law has family with Australian passports, the only Hong Konger. So it's, it's a rum show, isn't it? It's, it's, um, some people would say it was spectacularly hypocritical. I suppose it is, but it's understandable that people want the best for their families, but curious that they don't think the best for their families is leaving them with Chinese communist passports. Okay, I think that's a wrap for um, our interview. That's all the questions that we wanted to ask. Is there anything you would like to add? Anything no, more I just, happening at Hong Kong Watch? Or books up your sleeve? I'd like to say that it will continue to be, and I hope this isn't going to damage you um, irretrievably. Mm -hmm. It will continue to be something that people like me and people in foreign offices around the, all around the world uh, and people elsewhere watch. Um, I think that it's also important to say that um, uh, I regard handcuffs and chains as a bad emblem, symbol for Hong Kong. Um, but um, Ms. Lam and others must recognize that that's inevitably going to happen. And their assurances that everything's fine and nothing's changed just ain't regarded as true. Um, whether you're talking about banking with Hong Kong companies or whatever, uh, we know that it's changing. And the people who are still brave enough to say what's happening in Hong Kong and to speak out, I don't advocate breaking the law. It's, what I do say is it's very difficult to recognize the national security law as in any way compliant with the joint declaration and the basic law or the international covenant on civil and political rights. The head of the UN Human Rights 
um, said the other day that she was um, very concerned about the narrowing of the space for civic activity in Hong Kong. And she's not the only one. And that is not happening because of outside interference. It's happening because of the Chinese Communist Party. I want to distinguish, as I always try to do, between China and the Communist Party. It is not necessary to love the Communist Party in order to love China. Um, and uh, uh, people should remember the first, um, the first advice given by Confucius in the Analects when he was asked by Zillow, um, uh, what would be the first thing he did um, if he became leader of the country? And he said, um, rectify the names. And Zile is obviously rather puzzled by that, and so are quite a lot of people who've read the Analects. And what he meant was the same thing that George Orwell meant, that um, G.K. Chesterton meant, and others. What he meant was that people should, things should be and should act as they describe themselves. And if you're, for example, a Chinese leader who assumes you have the mandate of heaven, then you have to behave um, like a gentleman. You have to behave well and generously to people. Um, if you talk about the rule of law, that doesn't mean rule by law, it means rule of law. Um, if you talk about your responsibility to the people of Hong Kong, um, you should recognize that it would take a rum um, sort of description to think that that responsibility um, meant locking up as many as possible who disagreed with you and find, finding dissent an intolerable thing uh, in uh, your society. Um, I didn't like people disagreeing with me when I was an active politician, but it's part of living in any open society. It's part of living in any family. So I spend most of my time when I'm not concerned about family issues at the moment, concerned about Hong Kong, as well as concerned about the impact of Brexit if it when it happens on Britain but above all, while worrying about Hong Kong, which as I said at the outset, is the most wonderful place I've ever lived in. On that note, thank you very much, Lord Barnes, for uh, joining us, Lord Patton, thank you.